All right. In the next portion of today's lecture, we're going to discuss how this generic form of fit acute iteration that we covered can be instantiated as different kinds of practical deep reinforcement learning algorithms. So first, let's talk a little bit more about what it means for fit acute iteration to be an off-policy algorithm. So just to remind everybody, off-policy means that you do not need samples from the latest policy in order to uh, keep running your RL algorithm. Typically what that means is that you can take many gradient steps on the same set of samples or reuse samples from previous iterations. So you don't have to throw out your, your old samples, you can keep using them, which in practice gives you more data to train on. So intuitively the main reason that fit acute iteration allows us to get away with using off-policy data is that the one place where the policy is actually used is actually utilizing the Q function rather than stepping through the simulator. So as our policy changes, what really changes is this max. Remember, the way that we got this max was by taking the arg max, which is our policy, the policy is an arg max policy, and then plugging it back into the Q value uh, to get the actual uh, value for the policy. So inside of that max, you can kind of unpack it and pretend that it's actually Q phi of SI prime comma arg max uh, of Q phi, and that arg max is basically our policy. So this is the only place where the policy shows up, and conveniently enough, it shows up as an argument to the Q function, which means that as our policy changes, as our action AI prime changes, we do not need to generate new rollouts. You can almost think of this as a kind of model. The Q function allows you to sort of simulate what kind of values you would get if you were to take different actions. And then, of course, you take the best action if you want to most improve your behavior. So this max approximates the value of pi prime, our greedy policy, at si prime. And that's why we don't need new samples. We're basically using our Q function to simulate the value of new actions. So given a state and an action, the transition is actually independent of pi, right? If s, i, and a, i are fixed, no matter how much we change pi, s, i prime is not going to change because pi only influences a, i, and here a, i is fixed. So one way that you can think of fit acute duration kind of structurally is that you have this big bucket of different transitions, and what you'll do is you'll back up the values along each of those transitions, and each of those backups will improve your Q value. But you don't actually really care so much about which specific transitions they are, so long as they kind of cover the space of all possible transitions quite well. So you could imagine that you have this data set of transitions, and you're just plugging away on this data set, running fit a Q iteration, improving your Q function each time you go around the loop. Now, what exactly is it that fit a Q iteration is optimizing? Well, this step, the step where you take the max, improves your policy, right? So in the tabular case, uh, this, this would literally be your policy improvement. And your step three is minima minimizing the error of fit. So if you had a tabular update, you would just directly write those YIs into your table, but since you have a neural network, you have to actually perform some optimization to minimize an error against those YIs, and you might not drive the error perfectly to zero. So you could think of fit acute iteration as optimizing an error, the error being the, the Bellman error, the difference between Q phi SA and those target values Y, and that is kind of the closest to an actual optimization objective. But of course, that error itself doesn't really reflect the goodness of your policy. It's just the accuracy with which you're able to copy your target values. If the error is zero, then you know that Q phi SA is equal to RSA plus gamma uh, max A prime Q phi S prime A prime. Uh, and this is an optimal uh, Q function corresponding to the optimal policy pi prime where the policy is recovered by the argmax rule. Uh, so this, is, this you can show maximizes reward. But if the error is not zero, um, then uh, you can't really say much about the performance of this policy. So what we know about uh, fit a Q iteration is, in the tabular case, your error will be zero, which means that you'll recover Q star. If your error is not zero, then most guarantees are lost when we leave the tabular case. All right, now let's 
discuss a few special cases of fit acute duration, which correspond to very, very popular algorithms in the literature. So, so far, the generic form of fit acute learning that we talked about has these three steps. Collect a data set, evaluate your target values, train your neural network parameters to fit those target values, and then alternate these two steps k times, and then after k times, go out and collect more data. You can instantiate a special case of this algorithm with particular choices for those hyperparameters, which actually corresponds to an online algorithm. So in the online algorithm, in step one, you take exactly one action, AI, and observe one transition, SI, AI, SI prime, RI. Then in step two, you compute one target value for that transition that you just took. Very much analogous to how you calculate the advantage value in actor critic, in online actor critic, for the one transition that you just took. And then in step three, you take one gradient descent step on the error between your Q values and the target value that you just computed. So the equation that I have here, it looks a little complicated, but I basically just applied the chain rule of probability to that uh, objective inside the R min in step three. So applying the chain rule, you get dQ d phi at SI AI times the error Q phi SI AI minus YI. And the error in those parentheses, that QSIAI minus YI, is sometimes referred to as the temporal difference error. So this is the basic online Q, uh, Q learning algorithm, also sometimes called Watkins Q learning. This is kind of the classic Q learning algorithm uh, that we learn about in textbooks. And it is an on-policy algorithm, so you do not have to take the action AI using your latest greedy policy. So what policy should you use? So your final policy will be the greedy policy. If, if Q-learning converges and has error zero, then we know that the greedy policy is the optimal policy. But while learning is progressing, using the greedy policy may not be such a good idea. Here's a question for you to think about. Why might we not want to use the greedy policy, the argmax policy, in step one while running online Q-learning or online Q-duration? Take a moment to think about this question. So part of why we might not want to do this is that this argmax policy is deterministic. And if our initial Q function is quite bad, it's not going to be random, but it's going to be arbitrary, then it will essentially commit our argmax policy to take the same action every time it enters a particular state. And if that action is not a very good action, we might be stuck taking that bad action essentially in perpetuity, and we might never discover that better actions exist. So in practice, when we run fit Q iteration or Q learning algorithms, it's highly desirable to modify the policy that we use in step one to not just be the argmax policy, but to inject some additional randomness to produce better exploration. And there are a number of choices that we make in practice to facilitate this. So one common choice is called epsilon greedy. This is one of the simplest exploration rules that we can use with discrete actions, and it's something that you will all implement in homework three. Epsilon greedy simply says that with probability one minus epsilon, you will take the greedy action, and then with probability epsilon, you will take one of the other actions uniformly at random. So the probability of every action is 1 minus epsilon if it's the argmax, and then epsilon divided by the number of actions minus 1 otherwise. This is called epsilon greedy. Why might this be a good idea? Well, if we choose epsilon to be some small number, it means that most of the time we take the action that we think is best. And that's usually a good idea because if, we have a, if, we've, got, if we've got it right, then we'll go to some good region and collect some good data. But we always have a small but non-zero probability of taking some other action, which will ensure that if our Q function is bad, eventually we'll just randomly do something better. It's a very simple exploration rule, and it's very commonly used in practice. A very common practical choice is to actually vary the value of epsilon over the course of training. And that makes a lot of sense, because you expect your Q function to be pretty bad initially, and at that point you might want to use a larger epsilon. And then as learning progresses, your Q function gets better, and then you can reduce epsilon. Another exploration rule that you could use is to select your actions in proportion to some positive transformation of your Q values. 
And a particularly popular positive transformation is exponentiation. So if you take actions in proportion to the exponential of your Q values, what will happen is that the best actions will be the most frequent. Actions that are almost as good as the best action will also be taken quite frequently because they'll have similarly high probabilities. But if some action has an extremely low Q value, then it will almost never be taken. In some cases, this kind of exploration rule can be preferred over epsilon greedy because with epsilon greedy, the action that happens to be the max gets much higher probability. And if there are two actions that are about equally good, the second best one has a much lower probability. Whereas with this exponentiation rule, if you really have two equally good actions, you'll take them about an equal number of times. The second reason it might be better is if you have a really bad action and you've already learned that it's just a really bad action, you probably don't want to waste your time exploring it. Whereas epsilon greedy won't uh, make use of that. So this is sometimes also called the Boltzmann exploration rule, also the softmax exploration rule. We'll discuss more sophisticated ways to do exploration in much more detail in another lecture in the second half of the course, but these simple rules uh, are hopefully going to be enough to implement basic versions of Q iteration and Q learning algorithms. All right, so to review what we've covered so far, we've discussed value-based methods, which don't learn a policy explicitly, but just learn a value function or Q function. We've discussed how if you have a value function, you can recover a policy by using the argmax, and how we can devise this fitted Q iteration method, which does not require knowing the transition dynamics, so it's a true model-free method, and we can instantiate it in various ways as a batch mode off policy method or an online Q learning method, uh, depending on the choice of those hyperparameters, the number of steps we, uh, we take to gather data, the number of gradient updates, and so on.